A Course in Miracles, Chapter 15, Section 7, The Needless Sacrifice. Beyond the poor attraction of the special love relationship, and always obscured by it, is the powerful attraction of the Father for His Son. There is no other love that can satisfy you, because there is no other love. This is the only love that is fully given and fully returned. Being complete, it asks nothing. Being wholly pure, everyone joined in it has everything. This is not the basis for any relationship in which the ego enters, or every relationship on which the ego embarks is special. The ego establishes relationships only to get something, and it would keep the giver bound to itself through guilt. It is impossible for the ego to enter into any relationship without anger, for the ego believes that anger makes friends. This is not its statement, but it is its purpose. For the ego really believes that it can get and keep by making guilty. This is its one attraction, an attraction so weak that it would have no hold at all, except that no one recognizes it. For the ego always seems to attract through love, and has no attraction at all to anyone who perceives that it attracts through guilt. The sick attraction of guilt must be recognized for what it is. For having been made real to you, it is essential to look at it clearly, and by withdrawing your investment in it, to learn to let it go. No one would choose to let go what he believes has value. Yet the attraction of guilt has value to you only because you have not looked at what it is and have judged it completely in the dark. As we bring it to light, your only question will be why it was you ever wanted it. You have nothing to lose by looking open-eyed for ugliness such as this belongs not in your holy mind. This host of God can have no real investment here. We said before that the ego attempts to maintain and increase guilt, but in such a way that you do not recognize what it would do to you. For it is the ego's fundamental doctrine that what you do to others you have escaped. The ego wishes no one well, yet its survival depends on your belief that you are exempt from its evil intentions. It counsels, therefore, that if you are host to it, it will enable you to direct its anger outward, thus protecting you. And thus it embarks on an endless, unrewarding chain of special relationships, forged out of anger and dedicated to but one insane belief, that the more anger you invest outside yourself, the safer you become. It is this chain that binds the Son of God to guilt. And it is this chain the Holy Spirit would remove from his holy mind. But the chain of savagery belongs not around the chosen host of God, who cannot make himself host to the ego. In the name of his release, and in the name of him who would release him, let us look more closely at the relationships the ego contrives, and let the Holy Spirit judge them truly. For it is certain that if you will look at them, you will offer them gladly to him. What he can make of them you do not know, but you will become willing to find out if you are willing first to perceive 
what you have made of them. In one way or another, every relationship the ego makes is based on the idea that by sacrificing itself, it becomes bigger. The, quote, sacrifice, which it regards as purification, is actually the root of its bitter resentment. For it would prefer to attack directly and avoid delaying what it really wants. Yet the ego acknowledges, quote, reality as it sees it and recognizes that no one could interpret direct attack as love. Yet to make guilty is direct attack, although it does not seem to be, for the guilty expect attack, and having asked for it, they are attracted to it. In such insane relationships, the attraction of what you do not want seems to be much stronger than the attraction of what you do want. For each one thinks that he has sacrificed something to the other and hates him for it. Yet, this is what he thinks he wants. He is not in love with the other at all. He merely believes he is in love with sacrifice. And for this sacrifice, which he demands of himself, he demands that the other accept the guilt and sacrifice himself as well. Forgiveness becomes impossible, for the ego believes that to forgive another is to lose him. It is only by attack without forgiveness that the ego can ensure the guilt that holds all its relationships together. Yet they only seem to be together. For relationships to the ego mean only that bodies are together. It is always this that the ego demands, and it does not object where the mind goes or what it thinks, for this seems unimportant. As long as the body is there to receive its sacrifice, it is content. To the ego, the mind is private, and only the body can be shared. Ideas are basically of no concern, except as they bring the body of another closer or farther. And it is in these terms that it evaluates ideas as good or bad. What makes another guilty and holds him through guilt is, quote, good. What releases him from guilt is, quote, bad, because he would no longer believe that bodies communicate and so he would be, quote, gone. Suffering and sacrifice are the gifts with which the ego would, quote, bless all unions. And those who are united at its altar accept suffering and sacrifice as the price of union. In their angry alliances, born of fear and loneliness, and yet dedicated to the continuance of loneliness, each seeks relief from guilt by increasing it in the other. For each believes that this decreases guilt in him. The other seems always to be attacking and wounding him, perhaps in little ways, perhaps, quote, unconsciously, yet never without demand of sacrifice. The fury of those joined at the ego's altar far exceeds your awareness of it. For what the ego really wants, you do not realize. Whenever you are angry, you can be sure that you have formed a special relationship which the ego has, quote, blessed. For anger is its blessing. Anger takes many forms, but it cannot long deceive those who will learn that love brings no guilt at all, and what brings guilt cannot be love and must be anger. All anger is nothing more 
than an attempt to make someone feel guilty. And this attempt is the only basis the ego accepts for special relationships. Guilt is the only need the ego has, and as long as you identify with it, guilt will remain attractive to you. Yet remember this, to be with a body is not communication. And if you think it is, you will feel guilty about communication and will be afraid to hear the Holy Spirit, recognizing in His voice your own need to communicate. The Holy Spirit cannot teach through fear, and how can He communicate with you while you believe that to communicate is to make yourself alone? It is clearly insane to believe that by communicating you will be abandoned, and yet many do believe it, for they think their minds must be kept private or they will lose them, but if their bodies are together, their minds remain their own. The union of bodies thus becomes the way in which they would keep minds apart, for bodies cannot forgive. They can only do as the mind directs. The illusion of the autonomy of the body and its ability to overcome loneliness is but the working of the ego's plan to establish its own autonomy. As long as you believe that to be with the body is companionship, you will be compelled to attempt to keep your brother in his body held there by guilt. And you will see safety in guilt and danger in communication. For the ego will always teach that loneliness is solved by guilt and that communication is the cause of loneliness. And despite the evident insanity of this lesson, many have learned it. Forgiveness lies in communication as surely as damnation lies in guilt. It is the Holy Spirit's teaching function to instruct those who believe communication to be damnation, that communication is salvation. And He will do so, for the power of God in Him and you is joined in a relationship so real, so holy, and so strong that it can overcome even this without fear. It is through the holy instant that what seems impossible is accomplished, making it evident that it is not impossible. In the holy instant, guilt holds no attraction since communication has been restored, and guilt, whose only purpose is to disrupt communication, has no function here. Here there is no concealment and no private thoughts. The willingness to communicate attracts communication to it and overcomes loneliness completely. There is complete forgiveness here, for there is no desire to exclude anyone from your completion in sudden recognition of the value of his part in it. In the protection of your wholeness, all are invited and made welcome, and you understand that your completion is God's whose only need is to have you be complete. For your completion makes you His in your awareness. And here it is that you experience yourself as you were created and as you are. This concludes Section 7.